abres mis ojos, Señor, yo quiero verte, yo quiero verte. Okay. Okay. Eh, buenos días, mi nombre es Yvette Brito y me gustaría darles la bienvenida a la iglesia de Northview. Ese es el mes de um, herencia hispana y aunque yo soy latina, debo de decir que estoy un poco avergonzada porque no sabía que era el mes de herencia hasta que me, um, me dijeron que um, hiciera la bienvenida. <laughs> So I have, to, I have to read a little bit. My Spanish is really not that great. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> This is a thanks to Google Translate. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, un poco sobre mí. Mis padres son cubanos y ellos vinieron aquí en los años 60. Pero mi hermana, mi hermano y yo nacimos aquí en los Estados Unidos. Pero crecimos en un hogar que se hablaba español um, con muchas uh, tradiciones latinas y buena comida cubana. Um, let's see. Okay, yo he estado cerca de la iglesia por muchos años, pero en el, do, en el 2015 me encontré que me estaba alejando un poco y estaba, um, vine aquí a Northview porque quería encontrar um, en relaciones más cercanas y un sentido de familia. Um, un sentido de familia. Y eso fue lo que encontré aquí. Hace varios años atrás yo tuve una, un evento que amenazó mi vida y ahí fue cuando de verdad sentí en la comunidad de familia porque encontré que me cuidaron, me dieron, me traían comida eh, y rezaban mucho por mí. Eh, si ustedes están visitando o son nuevos a Northview, espero que encuentren ese mismo consuelo de la familia y amistad mientras adoramos juntos. Ok, now I'm going to do it in English. Translate it in English for those. Ok, good morning everyone. My name is um, Yvette Brito and I'd like to welcome you to Northview Church. 
This month is Hispanic Heritage Month, and although I am Latin descent, I had no idea that this was the month for <laughs> heritage. So I am a little bit embarrassed about that. <laughs> okay, a little about my background. My parents are Cuban, um, but my sister, my brother, and I were all born here in the U.S. We did grow up in a home where we spoke Spanish all the time, had a lot of Latin traditions, and very good Cuban food. <laughs> Okay, so I've been around the church for quite a bit, and in 2015, I felt like I was drifting away slowly, um, and I started attending Northview in hopes to find closer relationships and um, a sense of family, and that is exactly what I found here. I was able to make great relationships with very godly women who really helped me get back um, involved and um, closer to my relationship with God. A few years back, I had a, a life-threatening event, and um, uh, no, you know, okay, so I had the life-threatening event, and that's when I really saw the family units that we have here at Northview. You know, I was very taken care of. You know, had meals sent to me, prayers, encouragement. If you're new to Northview or are visiting, I hope that you can really find that comfort of family here as in friendships as we worship together. And now John Roberts is going to pray for us. In English. <laughs> okay. I didn't mean to send her off. I was just, uh, I'm grateful that she's my sister and we love her a lot. So um, I'm going to pray uh, some seasons in in our church uh you know things are going pretty well and pretty smoothly some seasons there's a lot happening you could argue that in a church this size there's always a lot happening and a lot to pray for and so i'm going to pray i'm going to start with a a scripture that um i uh was shared with me yesterday uh isaiah 40 sorry isaiah 55 12 you you will go out in joy and be led forth in peace the mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of thorn bush will be juniper, instead of uh, briars, the myrtle will grow. Uh, this will be the Lord's renown for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. And I just know sometimes we're in the thorn bushes, we're in the briars. <laughs> but with God, with God, there's this hope that is just hard to describe and we hope that um, you experience that journey towards towards something better so I'm gonna pray it's a long list here let's pray dear father uh, we approach you humbly and we approach you God just knowing that you are a big God we've read your stories they're on our hearts and in our minds and we ask you to uh, bring forth uh, the hope that you always promise in your scriptures, Father. Uh, we pray for Katie Scallion and her stepmom passing away and just uh, all of that entails. Uh, for Astrid's mom, Irma, God, and just uh, her health, God, we ask that you be part of that journey and help Astrid here and her family. Father, we pray for Sandy Heigrick. She is uh, special, and they are special. Uh, Father, we pray for this journey that they're on. Uh, please just be with her spiritually, uh, with the fear, with the emotions, but especially with the health. Uh, and let her know that uh, she, is, she is loved. Uh, pray for Leah Monica. Uh, they are stuck up in North Carolina, literally, um, can't get out. Uh, I pray you'll be with them and their fear and their food and their, uh, how they're going to be taken care of, God. Just please take care of them up there on the mountain. Uh, Father, um, lastly, for, um, uh, for Nichelle and her mom especially, and just her journey and this difficult. Uh, it's, there's a lot of separation, a lot of fear about how they're going to, 
to take care of all this and make ends meet and all that. God, just please, we look to you, Father, in every way. We know you hold out this um, picture, this joy that lay before us, but right now, a lot of us aren't experiencing it, and they're in the middle of it. God, just please be with them. Uh, thank you for uh, just being with us in every way. In Jesus' name, amen. I want Jesus to walk with me. I want Jesus to walk with me. All along life's pilgrim journey. I want Jesus to walk with me. I want Jesus, I want Jesus to, walk with me. to walk with me. I want Jesus, I want Jesus to walk with me. To walk with me. All along life's pilgrim journey. Life's pilgrim journey. morning. Turn in your Bibles to, uh, to John chapter 12. My name's Alex Hunter. It's a great privilege to help us continue the theme of the song about Jesus walking with us. John chapter 12 and verse 16. The scripture says, at first his disciples did not understand all this. 
Only after Jesus had been glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. John explains that, like many of us, the disciples didn't know what was going on at the time. Ever happened to you? You've been in a situation and then you look back later and you get it. Later on, as they reflected on Jesus' life, they began to understand his death, his resurrection, and his ascension in a deeper way. This was brought home to me recently with, uh, with the passing of my father. We can go to the next slide. Some of you know that I lost my dad in, um, in August of last year. Turns out that just like the disciples with Jesus, I didn't understand what my dad was teaching me. You know, I knew as a young man, I'm the one cheesing it on the, the left of that picture in case you're wondering. As a young man, I didn't know anything. It was clear that dad had a lot to teach me. But as an older man and as a dying man, I think my dad taught me even more. the last picture we have together. Interestingly, as life goes on, I'm able to put my dad's life and times into perspective. As things happen that often remind me of him, my reaction is, I know what dad would have said. I know what dad would have done. Yeah, I, I know what dad would have wanted me to say. And if you've lost somebody... You know that feeling, don't you? And then my grief started to turn to joy, and in a way I can't explain, I actually feel closer to him now. That I'm supposed to make him proud in a way that was different than when he was alive. So too with Jesus, I think the early disciples didn't understand his life until he had died. And I think as I reflect back on my dad's death, it helps me to reflect on Jesus during this time of communion. I pray like the song, like the song we sang talked about, I pray that we'll walk with Jesus in this time of communion, together with one another, together with him, and with the Holy Spirit. You know, this perspective of perhaps not understanding things at the time, but upon reflection, if I listen, I find deeper insight about my dad, and I think if we listen today in communion, maybe we'll get deeper insight about the Father, about the Son, and about the Spirit. On the next slide, we're going to read in, in John 16, verses 7 through 15. And John says, as he's quoting Jesus, getting ready to, uh, to go to the cross, probably on his last night or so with, uh, with the disciples, he says, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people don't believe in me. About righteousness, because I'm going to the Father. And where you will see me no longer and about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned I have much more to say to you more than you can now bear but when he the spirit of truth comes he will guide you into all truth he won't speak on his own he'll speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come so Jesus makes clear that unless he departs unless he dies the counselor the advocate the spirit of truth won't come and as we consider now this time of communion, which I hope for you starts right now, I hope this time of communion allows you to listen to God's Holy Spirit. Because it says that he will prove or convict the world wrong about sin. What the world says is sin or is not wrong, we believe is. And so based on what the scripture says, I pray that you would, would think about that. And you would think about these things that are really important. In fact, they are the, 
They're the existential questions of our life. So as we enter into deep communion with the Father, as we contemplate his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension, I want to invite you to think about these things. I want you to think about your sin, and I want you to think about what Jesus would say. Would he want me for you to keep feeling guilty when he's paid the price? Or would he just want you to repent and accept his forgiveness, his generous forgiveness in a time of refreshing? Your righteousness. What would Jesus want to say about my righteousness? Would he want me to keep striving, working to achieve, not always measuring up? Or would he want me to live into the freedom and the grace that he provided to accept the good deeds he's given to you in advance to do? What about judgment? Would he want me to live with the fear of, uh, with, with this impending fear? Or would he want me to live confidently knowing the prince of the world has already been defeated? See, Jesus tells the disciples he has more to say, more than we can bear or hear. But now that he's gone to the Father, I believe it's during this time of communion, this time of, of quietness, this time of contemplation, that we can listen to God's call for spiritual truth about us. Spiritual insight about grounding how to rightly live our lives and clarity about our life's purpose and peace. Let's pray and let us listen. Come, Holy Spirit, guide us into all truth. God, it's not the doctrinal truth we seek right now. God, it's truth about ourselves in front of you. Almighty God, as we enter your presence, help us listen to the Holy Spirit and his calling for our lives. God, help us bear up under and to hear the amazing grace that you've called us to. God, help us to accept the truth of who we are as forgiven sinners, clothing ourselves in your righteousness, God, living confidently in the humility that comes from following your Holy Spirit. Almighty God, send your spirit to fill our hearts and our minds with your voice and your calling. In Jesus' name, amen.
separate, um, separate and apart from our communion, uh, we set aside this time to talk about money. And um, if you've had someone pass away and you've been asked to be the executor of their will, you think about money a lot more than you used to. We don't like talking about money in church. <clears throat> and when, but uh, we're going to do it for a little bit here. When, when someone dies, that they leave a will, <clears throat> and that creates a lot of funny feelings for different reasons. And it's easy to get sucked into the mindset of wanting to control things. Like, shocker, right? You know, I'm so grateful for the leadership of our church, though, which we have a board of directors, we have elders who do such a great job of, of handling our money with responsibility, with accountability, and with integrity. And what that does is that frees up to think spiritually about money. And so as we approach this time to give, not a lot of us give in the plates, which is fine. You should please do if that's where you feel compelled. But I wanted to read a, a section of the scripture. This is in the Message Bible. It's not going to be on the on the screen, but I love the way Paul talks to the Corinthians because he's, um, he's not talking about, you know, waiting to have a lot of money to give, right, or when it's comfortable to give. Here's what he says. He says, now, friends, I want to report on the surprising and generous ways in which God is working in the churches in Macedonia. Fierce troubles came down, pushing those churches to the very limit. This trial exposed their true colors. They were incredibly happy, though desperately poor. The pressure triggered something totally unexpected, an outpouring of pure and generous gifts. I was there and saw it for myself. They gave offerings, whatever they could, far more than they could afford, pleading for the privilege to help out others. So we're going to pray for our contribution. And as we do so, I just pray that you'd let God think spiritually and help you to think spiritually about how you handle money and, of course, as we're stewards of what God's given us. Let's pray. Almighty Father, Holy Spirit, come not only into my heart, into my head, but God, into my wallet. God, help me, help us not to worry about money. God, help us to give generously from our heart trusting you give to us, you provide for us, and you own it all anyway. Father, we love you. Thank you for this time to give. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it all you shared. Um, I don't know if it struck you, it struck me when he said deep communion. I often don't put those two words together uh, because we don't look at communion as that special connection we have with God and to call us to a deep communion or a deep connection. It's only possible if we understand that that scripture that I've had many years of misunderstanding, he's going to come convict the world of sin, righteousness, and the judgment to come. And Wow, what a what a great way of looking at that to set us free so we can have deep communion. That the, our definition of judgment and our condemnation of ourselves is so unlike what he wants. He's saying the world's wrong about that. You're not condemned. I love that. I, I love that it's even like Sydney talked about last week during her communion when she talked about falling on the way to first base and then just giving up. You know, often we just we define our relationship with God that way. We're just... Oh, he's got to be so disappointed. I'm so embarrassed. That, that's why he's come. I, I love the emphasis, uh, the tie-in last week and this week. I will say, though, uh, it's not the same watching church online. I appreciate those who that's their only choice, and I appreciate you doing that, but I love being able to interact with people. <laughs> the magic is certainly in, in person, and I think it's a great gift that uh, I don't ever want to take for granted, so I'm thankful for this fellowship. Two quick announcements before we dismiss uh, the kids. Uh, the first one is about our marriage retreat. Um, it's a one-day retreat. You all fired up about that? You can go, Spencer. You might get inspired, buddy. Um, 
We'll, we'll, you know what we're going to do? It says 65 a couple. We'll go 32 if you want to go by yourself. I'll, I'll cover the other 50 cents, okay? But we are a last-minute group, so it would be really great if you were to register. We're not going to coerce you by saying it's going to go up to 70. If you don't, just, but please register. It would be very helpful if you register. It's in our bulletin, or you can just uh, click on that and register as well. Um, if you are new here, if you, you don't know our deal, our deal is if you can't afford it, register anyway, talk to us, and we'll cover your costs. We, don't, we never want costs to be an issue. Uh, it's part of the generosity that... Uh, is referred to, Alex referring to, just the way we approach things. So if you can't afford it, still register, we'll cover it. Uh, second announcement is we have a very rare opportunity uh, next Saturday. It's this coming Saturday, October 5th, uh, from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. If you can't come that whole time, that's fine. But the rare opportunity is we have a woman who's hurting. She just lost her husband to a, about a five-year battle to cancer. She's left alone with two uh, boys that are freshmen in high school. Her life has been turned upside down, and we can help her. She lives in Roswell, uh, but we need help. Uh, we're going to be, it doesn't sound like much, but uh, those of you who have been there know it's a lot. We're going to be emptying out a lot of stuff out of her basement uh, and helping out around her house. We did a project for her about a month ago. This is part two. We're hoping to have a three-part, but we really need help. We only had about seven or eight people sign up, so if you can come for all that time or part of that time, uh, just text me or email me or come grab me, but we really do need the help. Uh, we can even use uh, young people. Doesn't have to be all old people, amen? All right, we're going to dismiss the kids. Here's what we're going to do. If you have a child, fifth grade or below, you're going to take them this way and register them. Uh, there'll be a registration table just through the doors here. Middle school, you're staying with us. Thank you. And high school students, you're going to head to your class that direction. Let's stand for a song, and then Saj will come preach to us. Hopefully a few of you guys will remember this one. We haven't sung it in a while, but it's the oldie but goodie. All right. Trials dark on every hand, and we cannot understand All the ways that God will lead us to that blessed promised land But he'll guide us with his eye, and we'll follow till we die We will understand it better by and by By shelter and a food, thirsty hills and barren land. But we're trusting in the Lord and according to his word, we will understand it better by and by. By and by, oh, when the morning comes, all the saints of God gathering home, we will tell the story of how we've overcome. We will understand it better by and by. Temptations in its snares often take us unawares, and our hearts are made to bleed for each thoughtless word and deed. And we wonder why the test when we try to do our best, but we'll understand it better by and by. By and by, oh.
Good morning, church. Excited about our lesson this morning. The title is Friends. Some stick, some need to split, and some just won't quit. Title of my lesson, Friends. This is part two from last week, and I'm excited to be able to share it and, and engage a little bit more on what I think is a very important topic. So there is, a, there is, I think, a 15-year-old Sajin Sharma, and, and uh, my parents move from Illinois to, to Indiana, and, uh, and, and Sajin faces an existential crisis. He knows nobody, and he's, he's lost all his friends, and he's in this new space. And, and at this time, in a greater way than ever, I learned the value for me for friendship. So my, my parents would watch me, and I was normally an energetic child, lots of engagement, lots of running around, and, and I kind of started to droop a little. I just started to be a little more flat and a little less engaged. And my, and my parents were concerned, and they're like, what's, what's going on? And they'd ask me, and I'm like, Dad, I just miss my friends, just miss my friends. And uh, it got so bad, he calls my old friends up and says, would you, would you come out and come visit him? Because he's a mess, and it doesn't seem like we can do anything for him. Um, but, but I walked away from that, from, that, from that moment in time going, I value friendship. I would get to a point where I would talk about friends like jewels. They were jewels. God would give me a crown, and they were the jewels that would be in that crown. Friendship was valuable to me. It's super important to me. And, and as I've lived, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhere in my 50s now, and, and, uh, and this is what I've learned. This is what I've learned. And anyone who's, anyone who's in their teens will have probably figured this out. The source of greatest joy can be friends, and some of the source of greatest pain can be friends. And so... I thought it would be good to navigate this. I thought it'd be good to figure this out and manage some things internally with ourselves so that we can engage with friendship as God would want us to. Amen? Amen. Let's say a prayer. We're going to go ahead and get started from there. Father, we are we're grateful. So grateful for you. We're grateful for who you are. We're grateful for what you are. We're grateful that, Father, you are our Lord. That, Father, you have, you have power and sovereigns over the, over the environment that we're in. And that, Father, uh, you are moving in such a way as to guide us closer to you. We're grateful that you are our dad. That's, a, that's an identity that, Father, you have taken on. And that, Father, be, because of that, you've bestowed upon us the identity of child, son, daughter. And, Father, we have access to you that nobody else can have. We're grateful for that. But Father, you did not leave out the idea that you are our friend. In John 15, 15, you go, we no longer just call you servants, but you are now my friends. And Father, we want to explore what this means this morning. We want to look at this a little more closely. And perhaps, Father, we want to make some shifts in the way we think and the way we live moving forward. Please allow your Holy Spirit to guide us. Please, Father, help us to live lives that lift you up. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. So, friends. Friendship is so vital, so important, and yet it can, it can become a place where great joy can be fostered and, and great sadness and hurt can happen as well. And so what do we do? How do we manage this? And, and for me, as a Christian of about 30 years, what I've learned is that there are, all, to all my emotional solutions, to, to, the, to all my social so problems, uh, there is, I think, a theological truth that will help me unravel them. And it's really up to me to figure it out. Amen? So what's that mean for you? Let's look at the Bible is what it means. Let's look at the Bible for solutions, and let's look at what it can provide for us and, and help us out in terms of figuring out. Okay, so friendship, great, great joy, great pain. One of the things that bugs me, 
especially as I've, as I've been in the church environment for the last 30 years, one of the things that really bothers me is when people leave. Oh, I'm like, but we're buddies. We're pals. What, 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 what do you mean? What do you mean you're leaving? What do you mean you're... Do you really need a new job? Really? What about us? And I feel kind of selfish. And I don't actually say it. But it's what I'm feeling. It's what's going on in my heart. And I thought to myself, is this even accurate biblically? Is this, is this Sajin just with, a, with some sort of, you know, disorder? <laughs> and then I read Genesis. And I thought to myself, this is pretty cool. So God makes all of creation. God makes man. And God is talking to man. And he says to man, the Lord said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Let's pause there. Let's not go into our normal theology of, 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 of husband and wife. And let's just pause and think about what God just said. So who exists at this very moment? Man. And? And God. Okay, so God looks at this relationship and says, it's, that's not enough. It's not good for him to be alone. There needs to be more. And this kind of goes against the, 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 the thought process that as American Christians we can have. I can do this by myself. Yeah. That Lone Ranger Marlboro man yeah. is walking in, all the danger in the background. <laughs> Just light up a smoke. Not good at any level, by the way. All of it, bad messaging. And then the worst of the messaging is that you can do this by yourself. You got this. And it's bad messaging because it's a lie. And it's bad messaging because that's not the way we were made. We were not made to be alone. We were not made to walk by ourselves. We were not made to be Christians in God, and that's it. That's not enough. And it, can, it will never be enough. And so if that theology has become built into your, your psyche, understand the Bible is kicking against it. Yeah. It's saying, dude, no, 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 no. You actually need, you may not want, and we're going to get to that in a second, <laughs> but you need, you fundamentally need. If you had asked Sajin before the move, how important are friends to you? I'm like, eh. They're good, but wherever I go, I'll make new ones. But you'll never make those ones, you know? And there's something about that that is really instrumental. So some friendships, and this is where kind of the humanity of friendships gets involved. We're messy people. We're messy. We say things. And we walk away going, we're I'm going away, go, we walk away hurt, but not knowing we're hurt. And then we're like, what do I do with that hurt? Yeah. We have, this, we have this, this way of bumping into each other. And with the best of intentions. With the best of intentions. I remember there was a time, there was a time I walked through, and it wasn't here, it was at another congregation. I walked through, and I was holding the door open for somebody. And, uh, and, and I, I, I shut the door and I hugged the person, but I had closed the door on somebody else. <laughs> and I was, I was engaged, and I was just loving up on this person and the person on the other side of the door. The thoughts they had. <laughs> I know because they came and confessed them to me. <laughs> they go, do you not like me? Why did you close the door on me? Is it because I'm not important to you anymore? And I'm like, whoa. Drama, drama, and I've got this drama siren. Once drama starts, it starts going off, and I'm, mayday, mayday, pull up. <laughs> and I'm, and, and dr I'm like, this is, I was just wanting to say hi. But we bump into each other unintentionally, intentionally, and we hurt each other. And, and, and some of us can come to conclusions after years of this bumping going, I'm done. Man, give me a good book. Let, give, me some, give me a Netflix account, and I will be happy. You may be kind of content, but I would argue that you would not be happy. But we, 
we kind of bump into each other. How do we manage this? How do we deal with this? I think it's by understanding friendship. Their friends, some stick. Some need to split. And some just won't quit. And so what does this mean? This comes, this comes from, my, my daughter comes home one day and she was with one of her mentors and she came home and she said, Dad, I got some, I want, I, I, this person shared this with me and it's kind of changing my way of thinking. She goes, she, she, she was having some, uh, she was having an, engage, an interaction with somebody and, and they were talking about friendship and, and this, this very wise woman says, you know, there are some friends that come into your life for a reason. They come in for a reason. There are some friends that come in for a season. And there are some friends that are there forever. And this helps. This helps to understand that there, there's friendships, there's relationships that they are for a moment. They are for a reason, and God has placed them there. Then there's others that are for a season of my life, and that's great. And then there's, there, there, there's a friend and we're going to talk about that, that's forever. Let's talk about friends for a reason, or some stick. They stick for a little while, but then they, they, they fall right off. You ever have one of those stickers? It's like one of those posters that just kind of comes down after like a couple of days? Friends for a reason. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. It says in verse 26, this is an Ethiopian eunuch. He has come and he is celebrating the festival in Jerusalem, and he's reading reading uh, Isaiah. Let's read about him. In verse 26, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the candidate, which means the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem for worship. And on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading, Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This, uh, this is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants, for his life was taken from the earth? The eunuch asked, the eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here's some water. What, what can stand in the way of me being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then Philip and the eunuch went down into the water. Philip was baptized. Then they came up out of the water. The Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared as Astas at, at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Okay, let's look at this scripture. This is a, this is a pretty cool little scripture. It's an interaction uh, between Philip and, and uh, an Ethiopian eunuch. Some observations we can make about the Ethiopian eunuch. Number one, he was an important official. How can we make that observation? It says it. So no, nothing too special there happening. He's an important official. Um, we can also, also read from that scripture that he was probably wealthy. How would you know that he was wealthy? He had a chariot. Yeah, that's, a good, that's true. The ride he had. But he owned scripture. He had scripture. Scripture was rare. As abundant as it is now, scripture is rare. He had it in his chariot. This man had means. He had means that everyone else did not have. He had this precious scripture in his, in his hands. I want to just pause. Let's kind of divert for a second. The Bible is such a precious and special document. Amen. Yeah. And, and we live in a day and age where it is in abundance. It's everywhere and anywhere. 
And I would just ask, do not allow the abundance of the scripture and the access to the scripture to diminish your awe of the scripture. Because the Bible, the Bible is precious. The Bible is valuable. Maybe not in the same way monetarily it was back then, but it has jewels. It has treasure that will set your heart free. Do not minimize it because it is so commonplace. When you lift it up, you kind of have to be intentional because you're surrounded by it to go, this is God's word. Let me just pause. This is not a novel. This is not a storybook. This is not just another book. This is God's word. Okay, let me engage. And all of a sudden, it starts to shift and start to change. I want to say that because I think it, 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 it demonstrates itself here. This man's heart and his value of scripture and what God is saying to him and wanting him to hear was important to him. And I think there's a reason the spirit came down and said, go, Philip. To that guy because he was ready he was ready and I think God tills our hearts and as our hearts get ready he sends men and women into them so Philip goes another observation is it says he runs up to the chariot you know what it's a brother many years ago shared this with me this observation is it doesn't say the chariot stopped it says, go to that chariot. And it says he ran to the chariot. It doesn't say the chariot was in place. It said that he ran to the chariot. The chariot may have well been moving. So here's Philip running. Hey, dude, what you reading? <laughs> Isaiah, what are you doing? And he's just running with them. And I, I read about that and I think about that because I think, you know, it's, it's easy for me to go, oh, Philip just ran there and kind of just stood. You know, because we want life to be easy. We want outreach to be easy. We want friendships to be easy. And if they're not easy, if, they, if there's any sort of thing that kind of is a bump in the road, we push against it and go the other way. But I'm telling you, I don't, I think the chariot was moving. I thought about this. I think the chariot was moving. I think he was moving with the chariot. I think, and this is what I've learned. People, people, when they feel God, nothing's going to stop them. Nothing's going to stop him. God said, I need to be next to this chariot. I'm going to be next to this chariot. I wish it would slow down. I think there was a reason he got into the chariot and didn't speak from Philip. There was a reason, because, because the chariot was moving. And so they had this interaction. There are friends that come into our lives and they sacrifice for us. They give to us. And, and they come in with a purpose to kind of open new doors for our world, open new ways of thinking, help us to understand and grasp. And there's this connection that we feel. I, the people who did this with me, they ran up to my chariot, and, and they, they got in and they, they taught me, there's a special connection I have with them. When I'm feeling down or sad, I call. And, and, and it, it's just their voice. They don't have to say anything profound to me. But their voice is tied to a time in my life where God was opening my eyes. Amen. There are friends that come in for a reason. God sends them to you for a reason. And we need to be okay with that. My natural inclination is, I want them all here. <laughs> They're all going to stay close to me. And then when they don't, when the reason is over and perhaps they move on, I start getting the feelings. I start getting the emotion. But what happens from those emotions is I make a decision to not give my heart in the future to other friends that may come along. Understand that it's okay. And it's even biblical. There are very friends that come into your life. They'll come in for a reason. I'm not sure what that reason may be. It may be to study the Bible with you, to help you to see God. It may be to maybe help you overcome a certain bump or, or crisis in your life at this time. I'm not sure what the reason is. But there are people that God sends into our lives for reasons. Amen? Amen. Second point. Friends for a season. So I think people have come into our lives and there's very specific tasks that God may have for them. But then there are friends that 
we walk alongside for a while. And, and, that, and the specialness of that is pretty remarkable. Let's turn to Ruth chapter 1. Friends for a season. In verse 8, then Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my, dear, my daughters. Why would you want to come with me? Am I going to have more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and they gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is, it is, more, it is more bitter for me uh, than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. As, as th at this, they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. There are friends for a season. And we see in this, in this scripture that, that there, is, there, there are two women, and one, Naomi, one that sticks with her, Ruth, clings to Naomi. The other one, Orpah, ha goes, goes back home. And there's no judgment that's being carried here. Because there, there, there'll be friends that come in for seasons. It might be the season that you are raising children. It might be the season that you are, I, I'm not sure what it might be in your career, but friend, God places friends in for a season. And that season may be 20 years, 30 years. But what ends up happening is even those friends go. And this is kind of the bitter truth that I've had to come to realize about friendships is that they all come to an end at some point. Boy, that's depressing. <laughs> Holy cow, let's stop now. Even if it is death that brings the end. Friendships here on this earth, they're bound to be bookended. This leads me to my third point. Friends forever. There's a proverb within scripture. Proverbs 18 verse 24. One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. John 15, 15, Jesus says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything I've learned from my father I've made known to you. I'd like to stop and pause with the sobriety of the conclusion that, that depressed Sajin came to from points one and two. And I want to stop and I want to reflect on point three. There is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Why, why the use of word brother there? Because you're brothers no matter what. Until, until there is an end point. Until, until one passes. Then you were a brother or sister. But God says there's one who sticks closer than even a brother where death itself shall not be the end point, where friendship itself will at last through that final space and will connect us. There is a friend, and that friend is Jesus. But what's remarkable about this friend is what he does, is what he does for the rest of our friendships. There is a promise within scripture that if you are a friend of Jesus, that there will be a second, a second judgment. There will be a resurrection that happens. You will live again, the Bible says. There's this place, this place called heaven. And in this place, he will be. And in those places, in that place will also be the friends who were there for a reason. And the friends who were there for a season. Those two become friends.
forever because of what Jesus provides. I was with Saul the other day. We were talking. Saul and I like to lament about things. And, uh, and, and you know, I was just sharing some of my stuff with him. I was, just, I, was just, I, was in, I was having an existential crisis. And I needed a friend to talk to. And Saul was, Saul was there, and I shared it with him. And he and I both started talking about Moses. And, and, and <laughs> we were in the parking lot, <laughs> two Indians, <laughs> talking about Moses. And Saul, Saul was sharing with me his, his feelings about Moses. And, and, and this is what we were, we were lamenting on. Moses is trained, leads people, and these people are ornery. These people talk behind his back. They try to take his position. They keep talking down about him. I mean, these people, bleh. And Moses is steadfast. Moses just keeps going. And then Moses makes a mistake a couple of times. And God says, no promised land for you. <laughs> Saul and I hate this. Saul's in the middle. He's like, he's looking here and then looking up to God. This is Saul in the middle. He's like, really? Really? All that, all that, that faith, all that commitment, all that, really? But there's more to the story. Jesus is taken up to the Mount of Transfiguration. This is where Saul and I were like, breathe again. Because I can sit in that moment. I can sit with Moses watching the people march off. I think he might have been a little happy. <laughs> I'm, I'm not judging, but he might have been happy. So the, 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 the crisis that Saul and I were in may have been just different than, than, than Moses felt at that moment. But there was a moment in the future, and there was a man named Jesus, and this man named Jesus climbed a mountain. And on this mountain, he was transfigured. And it says that two people came to him. Who came to him on that mountain? Moses was one of them. And so Jesus is located where? In the promised land. And Moses didn't just get to be in the promised land. He got to meet the man. And, and, and this is what I walk away with. This is what I walk away with. The friendships I have, the pain, the, the challenges, the, 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 the hurt, all of it. When I surrender them to God, when I know that, I, okay, God, I don't like your timing. This really hurts. This stinks. But I trust you. There is a mount of transfiguration that is coming. Amen. There is a changing of the entire, all of it. And I will look back, I'm like, oh, that was the plan. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. I like how you did that. He has that in store for us. Yep. He has that in store for us. Our friendships, as challenging as they may be, are redeemed by God. And as we stay righteous, as we fight, fight on, we watch God work. There will be friends that you will naturally click with and connect with. There will be friends that will be a little bit harder. But each relationship, each relationship adds a spiritual depth to your heart, a space that only God could do. And then what ends up happening is at the end of your life, the end of our lives, there is this, there is this beautiful symphony. It's not of cars you own, not of houses you have. It's of lives you've impacted, that you've allowed to impact you. Christian friendship, Christian friendship transforms us changes us, and as it, as it does, we're able to change the world. Friends, some stick, some need to split, but there's one that just won't quit.
parents, if you could just wait till um, 11.30 to pick up your kids. We're ending a little early today. Blessings overflowing, leading us to home. 